Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for this. Um, I am Luis Manuel Garcia Mispireta. Luis is fine. Uh, and I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Birmingham. I'm also a longtime raver. Um, I've been involved in dance music uh, since 1995, essentially, since I started partying. Um, I am an ethnomusicologist, so I'm trained in uh, studying music from a cultural perspective and especially through ethnographic methods. So studying music by talking to people who do music um, and collecting their perspectives and their thoughts uh, and trying to piece that together into um, something that hopefully reveals something interesting that, that gives you insights um, into what music is, how it works, um, and how it matters to people. Um, I've also been co-curating with Joe Kelly uh, the Affect Stream for Rewire Festival, uh, and what I'm part of what I'm doing here today is providing um, a bit of a, um, an opening keynote to the Affect Stream, um, uh, but I'll also be giving that through a discussion of some elements of my book, um, which is forthcoming with Duke University Press. I'll get back to that in a second for those who are interested, um, but I have a monograph coming out um, entitled, and here it is, just below you, together somehow, music, affect, and intimacy on the dance floor. Uh, we'll I'll unpack that in a second. You'll get to see a table of contents, all sorts of things. So um, no stress. So I'd like to begin um, with a quotation. And this is a quotation from a book published in 1996 by Sarah Thornton. It's a book called Club Cultures. Uh, and it was the first, I would say at least one of the first, and certainly the most significant um, uh, at the time, uh, study, an academic study of uh, rave culture and also club culture in the UK in this case. Um, you know, within a few years of, of rave becoming, uh, you know, a national and then international uh, phenomenon. Uh, and this quote, I'm, I'm going to read through it, uh, and it sort of sets up and encapsulates a lot of what I want to to talk about today, and also what really motivates the entire book, right? This this the entire research project um, that built this was uh, is, is really linked to to this sort of a thought or observation that Thornton makes in passing in their book, um, but is well worth unpacking. So. Many clubbers talk about the rightness and naturalness of the crowds in which they have had good experiences. No, good. Um, they feel that they fit in, that they are integral to the group. The experience is not one of conformity, but of spontaneous affinity. Good clubs, good clubs here in quotation marks, of course, good clubs are full of familiar strangers. So how do we get to that experience? What, what does it mean to be in a club and feel like you're surrounded by familiar strangers. And when does that not happen? That's a thing that's not discussed as much, um, although it is something that's central uh, and really important to how I wrote my book and how I keep on studying dance music culture. Um, you know, we need to keep within the frame of dance music culture experiences um, and, and perspectives that are not you know, the ideal experiences that we that we want to have necessarily. Um, we, you know, we need to keep in frame all the ways in which electronic dance music and club culture in general sometimes fails to live up to the promises it makes. That's, this is, you know, central um, to, to how I am approaching these things, especially as a researcher who is queer, who is, um, you know, multiple migrant, uh, second generation um, migrant where I grew up, uh, and, and so on, right? So for all these reasons, I already have had, you know, many, ex you know, experiences many times of being in, in club spaces, um, hoping and expecting to, to go there to feel free, um, and to go there to feel connection and communion, uh, and to not have that happen, right? Or to have that disrupted, um, be because of the ways that, um, you know, racism, homophobia, other forms of discrimination make their way onto the dance floor, even though we sometimes go there to escape that. Um, or I would say often, many of us at least go to these spaces for them to be refuges, for them to be places where we can reinvent ourselves and, and try on, try out different ways of being and living, right? And, and dance music and dance floors can still give us that. Um, but part of what I want to do is think about how, um, how that intersects, you know, with, with, uh, with exclusion, with discrimination, with all sorts of things, right? Um, 
So I want to start by reading just the first two paragraphs of the introduction to my book. Um, and I'm going to leave this quote up because it really kind of um, rhymes with this quote or it responds to it or, or harmonizes with it, um, if we're going to go with the musical uh, uh, metaphors. Um, and once I'm done reading this, then I'll go through, introduce you to the whole book, to the whole project, and we'll eventually get to the question of stranger intimacy, uh, which is one of the promises I made for this keynote lecture. I'm going to talk about stranger intimacy on the dance floor. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, affect, and I'm going to also be bringing up the concept of liquidarity, which is a concept I more or less invented um, for this book and for this project. But you'll hopefully be able to see how this helps to explain, or at least how it helps me to explain the connections between musical experiences um, feelings and emotions, uh, and intimacy, especially intimacy in places where you might not expect it. So let's get started, or let's continue rather. The tricky thing about dance floors is that they are places where both inclusion and exclusion happen. Whether subtle or conspicuous, club cultures always find a way to signal who is welcome to join the dance. Electronic dance music scenes tend to emphasize their inclusivity while downplaying their exclusions. This tendency can be traced back to this, their subcultural origins, from the clandestine, queer of color, dance parties of early disco, to the mass gatherings of suburban youth in the 1990s rave era. Electronic music scenes share a history of utopian longing for radically open inclusivity, especially for those who experience exclusion everywhere else in society. As a result, these music scenes avoid explicit discussion of who belongs and how, instead relying on vague references to shared musical tastes, to open-mindedness, and to good vibes, whatever that means. This strategic vagueness is both a help and a hindrance, enabling dancers to temporarily enjoy a moment of belonging, uh, a moment of belonging unburdened, unburdened by the difficult work of identity politics, while at the same time enabling them to ignore the exclusions and the injustices taking place on those same dance floors. So such vagueness, uh, a vagueness about who, who includes, who's included, who's excluded, how we cohere as a group, right? So such vagueness helps to sustain social worlds that feel exhilaratingly expansive and yet also precarious, liable to disintegrate as soon as their underlying tensions are exposed. How do dancers get along in these fluid social contexts, where learning the details of other dancers' identities, values, and political affinities risks undermining their utopian fantasy of universal togetherness? Right, so, you know, what happens when a, the person who shares a dance floor with you actually doesn't have that much in common with you, and that shared kind of perspective was part of how you were imagining your belonging to the crowd that you're in, right? So this book, takes the dance floor and dance floor utopianism seriously, and so doing works to push electronic music scenes in the direction of those dreams. So this book sets out to explain this getting along in terms of stranger intimacy, that is, the gestures of social warmth, sharing and vulnerability between strangers that occur with surprising frequency and intensity at electronic music events. Um, and I'll just be referring to them as parties from now on, um, so at parties. It draws upon ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in the minimal techno and house music subscenes of three cities, Chicago, Paris, and Berlin, um, at the f at, as the first decade of the new millennium was coming to a close. So I was mostly doing work in most of what I captured in interviews and, and you know, through going to events and so on. Most of that is centered around 2006 to 2010, 2011. Using stranger intimacy as a point of departure, then, uh, this book considers the roles that tactility, gender, sexuality, music and sound, affect, intense experiences, and subcultural knowledge play in lubricating social interactions with fellow partygoers. In the process, I work to rethink intimacy through the diffuse, light-touch sociability of festive crowds. So let's keep going from here. Thanks for your patience there. But that's that hopefully sets up a little bit what I've been trying to do and what's important to me um, in this in this project. So here, this this slide really just kind of re um, rearticulates a bit of this. Uh, how do partygoers get along in these socially fluid and heterogeneous, so mixed contexts? Right. Part of the what's central to to what I'm trying to study here is how. You know, how do we get to a situation or a scene where people feel, or at least they're able to imagine and fantasize 
belonging to this big crowd while not feeling alienated by differences, right? Especially differences that could be really alienating, like political differences, you know, or, um, you know, or, or differences in, in how you, you know, how you act or your, your ethical values, moral codes, um, all sorts of things, right? So how does this work? And part of my claim here is that that works through vagueness, through avoiding the topic, through uh, never really saying exactly who belongs and who doesn't, but allowing other mechanisms to indirectly make those decisions for us. Um, and I'll get back to that. So here the focus is on intimacy on the dance floor, and in particular, stranger intimacy. So I don't want to exclude other kinds of intimacies, but I'm really fascinated specifically by the kind of intimate interactions, often really kind of brief fleeting moments that you might have on the dance floor and around the dance floor. It might be waiting in line, uh, you know, queuing for the toilet and having, you know, a surprisingly uh, deep conversation with a random person who's waiting in the queue with you. Um, the, you know, this can be uh, making eye contact very briefly on the dance floor during a really, ex a really uh, exhilarating musical moment, a really exciting musical moment. You know, and having that moment of looking at each other and thinking, you know, did you feel that the way I felt it? And maybe exchanging no words. Maybe you don't say anything to each other, but you just see each other for a moment um, and, and exchange a moment, uh, you know, smile at each other um, or maybe dance uh, to kind of at each other, um, you know, coordinate in some ways how you dance. There's all sorts of ways that you might have these moments of intimacy. Um, and it, it also can happen sometimes that maybe a friend of a you know a friend introduces another acquaintance to you and whereas in other social contexts you might be sort of polite and cordial in the context of the dance floor with the music and the sound and all the substances that you may or may not be taking um, and all the other sorts of things that get get your affect get your emotions and feelings and body um, pumping in all sorts of ways um, you, you might end up being really intimate with that person, or you might end up treating them like you've been friends for years uh, and, and having conversations like that all night, and then you never see each other again, right? Those, that, those sort of um, interactions are also what's important to me. Um, and so as I had also said in, in, as I was reading off the uh, beginning of my, um, of my book, uh, this fieldwork is centered mostly around 2006 to 2011, um, and towards the end, uh, if I have time, I'm going to go back and think a little bit about what's changed since I did my fieldwork in dance music, broadly understood, uh, and especially in the cities where I've been doing that research. Um, so let's keep going. So this is just to give you a quick sense of what's in, in the book um, before I zoom in more on stranger intimacy and so on. Um, I will be zooming in a little bit on chapter three, liquidarity. I'll read a wee little bit of that as well in a second. Um, but you can see as the chapters go in this book, I start very kind of closely focused on the dance floor and thinking about touch and intimacy. And where there I think about different touch norms, the way in which, um, you know, what is considered um, acceptable touch, welcome touch, um, unwelcome touch, um, violent touch, and so on. All of these boundaries um, can be culturally different in different places in the world, but um, even so, one of the things that I, that I found and that, you know, that I observed, but also people that I was interviewing, um, you know, would confirm and observe as well, was that the, the norms for touch and, and how that relates to intimacy and whether or not that means intimacy or means something else, like, for example, harassment or, and violence and so on, um, all of those boundaries shift substantially between everyday kind of public life out on the street and how people experience and how people interact um, in club spaces and on dance floors. Um, it, in general, touch and tactility and and um, tactile intimacy is much uh, more intense in club events. Uh, sometimes too intense for some folks. Sometimes you know, uh, and sometimes it's intense in ways that are unexpected if you are coming from a different music scene and so on. Right. So I, I want to keep all of those factors in 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 view right but the the general idea here is that yeah there's a there's a lot of tactility a lot of casual tactility tactility a lot of um uh, a lot of physical and embodied ways of expressing intimacy and social warmth that happen in these spaces you know even though at the, the those happen at the same time or in the same space where um, touch is also being used in oppressive ways um from there i spend a chapter thinking about sonic tactility so the way in which 
uh, sound, but especially the sound of electronic music, uh, whether that's dance-oriented music or experimental acousmatic music, um, that the, the, the entire kind of world of electronic music uh, really makes a lot out of, or really focuses on... Um, on texture, on sonic texture, on granularity, on grain, on sonic grain, um, and and those sorts of things, uh, which I argue makes uh, electronic music a very tactile um, medium and a very tactile genre or style. Right. So in other words, um, I point to and I focus on how um, the use of beats, the use of sound samples, um, the the use of grain, sonic grain, which is a, a concept, you know, at least it's one that I trace to Pierre Schaeffer, but also other folks um, have been thinking about this as well. All of this makes um, electronic music a, um, a, you know, a, a kind of music that you, sure, you hear with your ears, but you hear it through your flesh, you hear it through your body, through your bones, through your cavities. You know, it's music that you feel on the skin. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and, and the music itself is designed, I would, and that's what I argue in that chapter, it's designed to make that happen, right? To really um, force or to take advantage of the fact that you can sense touch on your skin, in your bones, in your flesh. Uh, and and uh, electronic music takes advantage of that. Um, I'll leave it at that, let's move on. So chapter three, liquidarity. I'm gonna zoom into that in a second and actually on the next slide I have some quick summaries of the four chapters that I've highlighted here. Um, we're only zooming into one, but I'm providing those four because they all kind of connect. But what you can see as you look at these titles here is I take that metaphor of touch um, and tactility uh, and texture specifically, um, and move that through the chapters. So in chapter three, I'm thinking through fluid metaphors. Um, in chapter four, I'm thinking about how things coagulate and thicken and come together and turn into something solid. Um, in chapter five, I'm thinking about unraveling at things coming undone, especially in chapter five, I, I focus more in on people's storytelling and the way that they think about and remember partying, how they go out, what's a good night out, and what kinds of things make a good night out, what kind of experiences make a good night out. And it turns out that in club culture, and I would say a lot of nightlife, there's a real value placed in rough experiences and really intense experiences that might actually not be even all that pleasant in the moment, but then are remembered as adventurous and as exciting and so on. Uh, and part of that, I would argue, is coming undone, is, you know, there's, there's a real... Um, value placed on the experience of kind of unraveling, not falling apart completely, but kind of stretching out and snapping back together again. Um, so I spend a chapter figuring out what's pleasurable about that, why people enjoy that. Um, chapter six um, zooms in more specifically on um, the the ways in which um, the ways in which club and festival and rave spaces, um, primarily club spaces, uh, how they manage inclusion and exclusion at the door. So even though I was saying earlier that culturally or subculturally, there's a tendency to um, avoid really talking explicitly about who gets in and who doesn't, nonetheless, at many clubs, there still are um, there's, there still are forms of kind of hard filtration and selection um, that, uh, that, that do exclude, right? And, and do that kind of the, 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 the unpleasant business of choosing who gets in and who doesn't, sort of on behalf of the rest of that scene or crowd and so on. Like it's done at the door so that you then can pretend that you didn't see it when you get inside, if you know what I mean. Um, and again, that's a chapter that I'm not going to zoom in on in too great detail, but I'll leave it at that. And the final chapter, the epilogue, spends some time um, reviewing a lot of the points from the previous chapters, trying to connect them together. Uh, and I also have a section there where I reflect on the Orlando shootings, the, the massacre that happened at Pulse Orlando in, two, in 2016, um, and how that how that was sort of remembered publicly, but very emotionally and intimately as well by queer folks, especially queer folks of color and especially Latino, uh, uh, Latinx uh, folks in North America, of, of which I am one. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so we'll leave it at that and we'll move on.
So here, here you can see just keywords unpacking some of these chapters. Again, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I leave this, uh, or I have this this slide in here in case you're interested. You can, you know, pause the video and spend some time reading more closely what these are about. So I won't say too much about liquidity here. We're about to dive into that in more detail. Um, but here, if you imagine that chapter three is thinking about, um, or li the liquidity chapter rather, is thinking about fluid solidarities and and crowds, how crowds can hang together but they hang together in this very um, fluid, mobile, precarious, volatile way, right? Um, then the chapter after that is trying to think about how, um, how do those kind of fluid crowds turn into something a bit more solid and a bit more stable, or at least feel like something more solid than just a, a kind of a passing crowd. Um, and what role does music play in that? What role does affect, especially shared affect, play in that? Um, and in particular, I make this argument that it's music provides this sort of ex experiential or sense sensory baseline. Um, or, or you know, ground. Let's say a shared ground um, of of experience, and especially of sensory experience on that dance floor, um, which then becomes a basis for people to have shared affect, right? Or at least to feel like they're sharing affect. So to feel like they're sharing emotions and feelings and atmospheres and sensations, and then and that then makes it enables, let's say, makes it easier, makes it possible for people um, on the dance floor sharing those moments of of you know of affect of of, of music. Um, to feel like they're sharing something because they are sharing something, but then what is that something, right? And it becomes possible then for people to imagine or project or fantasize that the something they share is much more and much bigger than just being on the dance floor at the same time. And so I try to explore how that works. Um, coming undone, I've, I've already kind of unpacked that on the previous slide there, or as I was discuss discussing the previous slide. And the same thing with bouncers, um, or the chapter on bouncers rather. Um, the one concept maybe here that I'd want to unpack a little bit is this idea of embedded diversity. Um, and it, I go into much more detail in the chapter, so, you know, buy the book, um, you know, to, to read all of it in detail. But I make this argument that um, a lot of clubs, especially in Berlin, where I was, where I focused in the most, I would say, for this chapter, um, at a lot of Berlin clubs, there would be very kind of curated performances of diversity of a certain kind of sort inside the clubs. And that was often very carefully curated by the people at the door. Um, but that expression, or not that expression, but that performance of a kind of cosmopolitan, you know, um, getting along while everybody looks different in certain ways or, or so on, is all embedded still within a larger uh, framework of exclusion, right? That, you know, it's the these 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 scenes of apparent diversity, and, and I wouldn't say that they're like not diverse in at least some ways, but the that kind of curated diversity and eclecticism, I would say, curated eclecticism is comes to, to stand in for a much broader understanding or much broader definition of diversity um, when it's not really that. Um, and in particular, that then serves to uh, that's that comes to serve as a kind of a counter argument against accusations of exclusion um, at the door by bouncers and other other door people, uh, and also through other through other forms of exclusion that are kind of systematic um, in club culture. So let's move on from here and zoom in a little bit to the concept of liquidarity. So. I have also, again, a passage I'm going to read, uh, just a short one from the beginning of chapter three. Um, and I'm going to leave these points just up on the on the slide as I read. You'll see that the, this paragraph that I read more or less covers a lot of what's on this slide, um, you know, in a slightly more elaborated form. So the opening question in this chapter is, who can you count on when you go out dancing? What is your responsibility to fellow partygoers? Do you belong to something by sharing a dance floor? With whom and how? Nightlife scenes are simultaneously social realms, leisure sites, and entertainment industries, where, wherein participants share an interest in cultivating atmospheres of suspended responsibility and enhanced conviviality. So, you know, less consequences or at least the imagine the the idea of, of like less consequences things are less serious and also everybody is more friendly everything is a bit more social right that's sort of the the atmosphere that these spaces want to cultivate right and need to cultivate if they're going to be successful so suspended responsibility and enhanced conviviality between strangers or 
quote, relaxed and friendly vibes, end quote, right? Which is a phrase that you often see, uh, or I often see, um, positively describing certain kinds of dance floors, or at least what people want uh, to feel on the dance floor. And so a desire prevails among partygoers for social encounters to be smooth, to be simple, open, and friendly, which contrasts puzzlingly against the conspicuous lack of clear community guidance about how such interactions should occur in an anonymous crowd. So in other words, you know, we never get like explicit instructions, or we rarely do, actually, you know, that's one of the things that's been changing more these days. But um, certainly when I was doing this research, it, there is rarely discussion about um, what it means to share a dance floor, how one behaves on the dance floor, um, you know, what kinds of behaviors indicate that you're inside the group or outside the group, and so on. So in spite of this lack, in spite of this kind of avoiding the topic, partygoers often remember parties filled with chance encounters, surprising stranger intimacy, conviviality, and the diffuse glow of social warmth. In the minimal electronic music scenes of Paris, Berlin, and Chicago, so that's where I was mostly focusing. I was there, you know, 2006 to 2010, 11-ish, or that was when I was doing this research, and that was the kind of the end of the the height of the minimal era of the early 2000s. So I was I was mostly working within the minimal house and minimal techno and micro house and so on scenes of these cities. So in these scenes, partygoers seem to avoid the sort of questions that open this chapter. And this in turn raises questions about why they avoid explicit talk of belonging in music scenes that have historically valued openness to difference. The puzzle of this chapter then is how gestures of warmth, care, and support manifest in a context of casual contact and vague interpersonal knowledge. The account developed here highlights a combination of loose stranger sociability and vague belonging, and vagueness is gonna be an important concept, um, which I call liquidarity. Liquidarity, in other words, a fluid togetherness that manages to hold the shape of a heterogeneous and unconnected crowd. So under conditions of liquidarity, um, Participants maintain a vague sense of social belonging, recognition, and even intimacy, while also enjoying the benefits of anonymity, of fluidity, and a certain lightness of, of social contact. In other words, this is a form of belonging that feels firm enough to support social cohesion while remaining fluid enough to accommodate a wide range of ideas about what such cohesion entails. So in other words, it's both... Um, it, it provides a sense of kind of stability or at least enough stability to support cohesion or to support behavior that seems like social cohesion of, of togetherness and belonging, um, but at the same time is vague enough that it can accommodate a lot of different ideas about what that belonging is. Uh, so liquidarity also captures an important aspect of public culture well beyond electronic music scenes. It defines the affective, here affect in the sense of emotional or feeling or felt, it defines the affective relationships that can arise between people who are not bound to one another by traditional ties of kinship and affinity. Uh, so in other words, liquidarity for me at least is also a way to think about um, connections and and um, connections and social social interactions that are not dependent on more kind of structured um, and and more stable and solid um, forms of social organization. Uh, so the term liquidarity also suggests the precariousness and volatility of such underdefined relationships. Right, that when these when we're operating in this zone of not really knowing everybody around and not really knowing how we're supposed to behave or not really knowing what's in everybody else's heads, but you but you have to interact with them anyways, right? In those um, in those contexts, um, th there is there is this risk, this this heightened risk, or there's this fragility. Actually, is a good way of putting it. Liquidarity is quite fragile, so it makes a lot of things possible, things that might not have been socially possible um, without it. But at the same time, it can very easily be disrupted. You know, any small thing can kind of ruin or or shatter that 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 image or that that uh, I don't want to use the word illusion, right? But it can shatter that feeling that people might have of belonging to a, a crowd much bigger than them. So let's move on from here. Um, so here, actually, you know, I, sh I should have had this up for a, a couple seconds earlier. You know, let's pause on this for a moment, nonetheless. But liquidarity, big concept here that I want to spend a bit of time with. Um, and indeed, right, loose sociability um, is a, a bit here that I've underlined. 
Um, liquidarity, for me at least, is describing this sense of being kind of socially connected, but in this loose way, it's kind of vague, it's undefined, uh, but, you know, don't worry about it. It's fine. You know, like that, it's that kind of a thing. It's like, yes, 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 you know, it works for now. It enables us to get along, at least kind of, you know, it enables us to enjoy our time on the dance floor and maybe imagine that we're having, you know, wonderful, um, uh, liberating experiences, that we are having connections and and um, interactions across difference in ways that kind of feed into you know um, f feed into liberal or radical desires for you know for um, openness and belonging right um, so it allows all of these things to happen but also like mm, don't look too close like don't don't ask too many questions about how that works right uh, and so one of the problems or one of the risks of liquidarity is that it also serves to cover over, the exclusions and the injustices that still happen in these spaces and at the doors of these of these venues. So here, I want to spend just a moment. This is just one kind of fragment from my from my fieldwork that I want to you know to give you as an as an example of like one little nugget from what is otherwise a huge archive of interviews and 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 fieldwork trips that um, that are part of this, right? And from here, I want to bring out one or two points about liquidarity. So here, this is an interview with Fontomet, um, one of my interviewees. Um, it's a pseudonym, obviously, or it's a nickname. One of my interviewees from Paris. This interview was in 2009. And you'll notice that um, where I have four points, four periods, right, rather than three, where you have four, um, that's an actual pause in speech. Um, and so this this particular quotation is a direct and like verbatim transcription. And I did that deliberately. I don't normally do that. But for here, I wanted to have a description of or a transcription of exactly what she was saying, including the moments where she stopped halfway through a phrase and rephrased things or re you know, rethought what she was saying and interrupted herself and so on. And that's because, you know, the, this was her answering my question where I was asking, you know, when was the last time you had an experience where you felt like the crowd really clicked and came together? And why? What made that happen? Uh, and and so here she is kind of talking and thinking at the same time, working out her thought. And you can see, you know, she, 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 it takes several attempts, so to speak, before she can kind of get at what she wants to describe. And for me, that's important because this is part of that observation or that pattern I was noting of, um, you know, of clubbers and ravers and party goers um, generally avoiding the topic of who belongs and how and why. And then when you ask them, this is kind of what you get, right? And this is Fontomet doing a great job respond, you know, responding to this question. Um, there were other folks I would interview or that I would have casual conversations with at the club for whom, you know, this amount of like thought and detail absolutely did not come in, right? So here we go. So she says, I think that the slightest barrier, I think that it's already nighttime and you don't have... Well, you look at the majority of people that one encounters at a party, you know their first names, you don't even know their last names, you don't know about jobs, you don't know about their brothers and sisters, you don't know. Ultimately, you know a fair number of people at a very embryonic level, right? Like at a starting level, let's say, or a superficial level, I think. Um, and in turn, you have less of those social barriers than you might have during the daytime. Or in any case, you don't self-impose those barriers because of social or cultural differences or money, you see. And by the way, this is my translation from French. Um, so here, what's part of what's interesting on the one hand is, you know, the, how how much um, effort it takes to kind of get to this conclusion or to get to this explanation, um, but also this emphasis on not knowing, right, that you don't know. Um, and that the, the lack of knowing, right, so this is where we get to stranger intimacy for me, it, the lack of knowing some of these details about a person's back, life and background and so on, um, makes it possible to suspend, at least temporarily suspend, some of the uh, antagonisms or affinities that you might have with other people based on, um, you know, their their cultural identity, based on, you know, race, based on, um, uh, based on class, and so on. Of course, not everything can be rendered kind of invisible and unknown in this way, and like, you know, we're all clockable in some way, right? You know, pe people can still you know, look at how we're dressed and make some judgments about our class or that people can, you know, make judgments from our body about gender, sexuality, um, ethnicity and race and so on. Right. So this doesn't necessarily ne necessarily um, describe a situation where nobody uh, or where you don't know anything about a stranger. But it's this reduced amount of interpersonal knowledge that for Fontomet and many other folks that I interviewed 
played an important role in making it possible to have a, just a nice time in a crowd and like not worry too much about it. You know, don't worry about it, that kind of a thing. So let's keep going. One of the other concepts that's important for me for this development of liquidarity, and I, I will come back in a second with some summary points, right? But um, an important inspiration for me is the concept of the intimate public. And here public in the sense of public sphere or a reading public. So think about audience as well as a version of public in this in this instance. Um, this is a concept that was developed by Lauren Berlant, um, who is uh, who's really important to me as a as a thinker um, and and a scholar, but also uh, they were my one of my main um, mentors when I was in grad school as a PhD student. Uh, and they sadly passed away last year. So this is very much in memoriam, um, Lauren. Um, and in particular, I want to draw from a book that they published quite some time ago in 2008, The Female Complaint, um, The Unfinished Business of uh, Sentimentality, I believe that was the whole title. I only have the abbreviated title here at the bottom. But in the introduction and in the preface, as well as the first chapter, they developed this concept of the intimate public. So an audience or a public sphere that's somehow also intimate, right? And we, we tend to see public and intimate as separate things, you know, although in, in our current age of like highly accelerated um, social media, online presence and so on, this this opposition is maybe not as 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 firm or as as stable, let's say, as it was in 2008. But in any case, the idea of an intimate public here is a public sphere. So something that is produced in a public sense and circulates publicly uh, and notably in the case of this book, um, uh, Lauren or, or Berlant rather was focusing on uh, the development of women's culture or the idea of a specific and separate woman's culture that was cultivated through, um, in this case, an archive of American films, right? 20th century American films, especially the sort of mid 20th century, mostly black and white melodramas, right? Melodramatic film, sentimental film, all of that seen as part of a kind of a culture for women by woman, or at least directed at women. Um, and so the idea here is that a public sphere, or an intimate public rather, is a public sphere where participants presume that they already share a worldview and emotional knowledge that they have derived from a broadly common historical experience. Um, so the idea here is that the intimate public creates a scene, so here women's culture, a scene of cultural consumption to which its participants expect to belong based on their belief that the affective, that is the emotional and felt shape of women's lives are generic enough to be shared. So there's this sense that you you belong to this intimate public because you feel, you know, partially just because you feel you do, um, but also because you believe or you're willing to believe that whatever defines that intimate public is broad and gen generic and flexible enough that different kinds of, of versions of that identity or that idea can all be welcomed into that space, right? And so notably an intimate public thrives on its own incoherence about what supposedly makes it cohere. So belonging here is based on feeling and vagueness, but not details, not explicit criteria, and so on, all right? So whereas, uh, Berlant was talking about women's culture here. I'm thinking more about club cultures and dance floors as that's the framing device, right? Is is whoever whoever manages to get into the club and f show up on the dance floor can feel like they're part of this intimate public. But as you can see with this definition, that, def that the, the intimate public of the dance floor is one that's quite incoherent about who's there and why and how they got in and who didn't get in, which is rarely mentioned and so on, right? So... Moving on, and here we're getting close to wrapping up. Um, so liquidarity then is a number of things. It's a sense of solidarity based on circumstances that remain vague and in constant flux. Um, liquidarity is something that absorbs or it brackets, um, brackets away difference, right? So it provides a way for, for people to sort of wave away certain forms of difference and be like, ah, it doesn't really matter because what really matters is that we're on the dance floor and we love music, right? That kind of, um, that kind of idea. So. It brackets difference, which is maybe enabling or, or helpful or positive in some senses, right? Um, especially if those differences are, are uh, alienating for some people, right? But it also dampens those antagonisms. So in other words, it can distract us from the oppressions, the exclusions, the injustices that are still happening in our spaces where we go to party. Um, so uh, also, and I think this is an important bit, um, intimate publics and liquidarity specifically 
enable or they create a scene of collective care. They create a, a scene where people can be socially warm to each other and, and you know, they, they maybe won't always, but they can. And they can feel like that's a thing that they can venture to do in those spaces with strangers. But it also makes all of the failures and, and kind of frizz, fissures, breaks in that kind of fantasy, it makes them invisible in a way that's maybe not so helpful, especially for those of us who go into these spaces and have a real hard time getting to the point where we can feel that liquidarity because the the, discri the dis discrimination and, um, and violence and so on is in our faces and is constantly um, interrupting that kind of um, experience. So here, I think thinking about uh, thinking about time and so on, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to go through this a bit faster and then wrap things up. Uh, so how has clubbing changed? Right, the, the the TLDR is it has a lot in the last ten years, uh, and let me give you a quick overview of what that's like. Um, so here in these four images here as I bring them up. Um, this is just a quick kind of cross section um, to give you an example of what, what has the, the arc of how things have changed in the last 10 years. In 2013, I wrote a piece for Resident Advisor um, uh, on uh, called An Alternate History of Sexuality and Club Culture, where I was uh, trying to kind of do a revisionist history or, or a counter history. I was trying to combat what for me I was seeing as the kind of whitewashing and straight washing or hetero washing of um, electronic music culture, especially during the EDM boom, right, which was already in full blast by 2010. Um, you know, a few years later, uh, a similar piece is written with a focus on North America. Um, and you'll note it's a 2016, but before the Pulse Massacre, right, America's gay techno underground. To be fair, mostly focused on um, on cis gay men's parties, uh, but then that evolved. The same author then had a piece in 2019 um, uh, focusing on Honcho Campout, which is a, a yearly event, a summertime uh, event uh, that you might, some of you might already know uh, and be familiar with. And notably, the phrasing goes from gay techno underground to que queer techno underground within, you know, with um, same author, but, you know, two different pieces. Um, and then in that same year, we also get a piece specifically on queer sex positive parties. So sex positive parties, again, with this framing around queerness um, and and within the article itself, at least more of a, a focus as well on, um, you know, racial and ethnic diversities. Uh, so with that, how, you know, what are some of the shifts that have happened here? So as I was describing earlier over the last 10 years, 10-ish years, um, there has been that EDM boom and that has had uh, a mainstreaming effect, which has, you know, both positive and negative uh, sides to it. But certainly this sort of cis het washing and whitewashing of the history of electronic music is something uh, that I think a lot of us felt early on. Um, also in that, in this period, there's been a rise of queer rave collectives uh, in all over the place. So not just in big cities with big scenes, but even in smaller towns uh, um, and smaller cities, medium cities, and so on. Um, there are more of these collectives um, that that were just popping up everywhere, especially in the middle of the 2010s. Uh, and most of them had some kind of an explicit um, stance, which some would claim is a political stance, others might claim is not explicitly so, but I would say it is in some sense a political stance to reclaim and to recenter rave and club culture around the queer and black and brown and of color communities, trans and so on, um, that founded this music, right? That were that were central to the development of electronic uh, dance music, you know, popular electronic music. Um, so there's, a, with that comes increased visibility, which is important for certain kinds of political action and activism, but also this meant that we had to contend with um, hyper visibility. And, the, you know, in, in the context of hostile attention, especially on social networking sites, um, like Twitter, for example, but also many others, Instagram, Facebook, etc. And this, especially since we just had, uh, I mean, at, on the date of recording this, uh, we just had the Trans Day of Visibility just yesterday, and many of the statements that were coming um, across Twitter, at least, by trans folks marking that day, many were saying, you know what, we're visible enough right now, what's more important is who's fighting with us, who's protecting us, right? Uh, you know, and there are many points, very good points being made that visibility without some form of support and, and empowerment um, and solidarity, especially visibility without offering also solidarity is just exposing, especially, you know, exposing um, 
uh, marginalized and stigmatized folks to harm, right? Or like putting them at risk, putting them out there essentially to get attacked. Um, so that's something that I think also queer rave collectives in the last 10 years had to think about a lot. Um, the vernacularization, and by this I mean kind of popularization, democratization, just easy access um, of activist discourses and practices. So the way that you know, grassroots organizing principles and, and rhetoric and tropes and so on are kind of in the water generally in a way that they were not um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, and of course we have BLM, you know, Black Lives Matter to, to thank for a lot of that, but it, but also many other sort of movements, you know, Me Too as well. Uh, I have a few hashtags at the end here that you'll see that give you kind of a cross section of what I what I noticed happening in that decade. But we also have this a retrenchment, or a return to uh, or a rise of right wing violence, increased an increased political power of extreme right um, parties in politics and across the board, so to speak. Um, you know, not just in the U.S. or not just in the U.K. or Germany, but in many, many places. Um, of course, there's also been the impact of the pandemic towards the end, or actually at the very beginning of this this um, decade, uh, which is decimated the nightlife sector you know things are reopening now um is this a time to reopen who knows i mean the the, the i mean who knows many people have opinions about it right but it's it this is we've been trapped in a, a two-year cycle of closing and reopening and closing and reopening um with uh, which has had lots of negative impacts on nightlife sectors in general and especially has has been a real challenge for vulnerable communities for whom these some of these club and rave spaces were the only places where they could gather safely or at least in in more safety than gathering you know in in public spaces um and yeah there's also debates about when is the right time to return to partying um plague raves colonialism and tourism so you know the the for a while especially in 2020 there is this pattern of you know djs uh and and, and party goers you know respecting um, bans on gatherings in their home country and then flying for a vacation to a, a part of the world where, um, you know, where, where the, the reliance on tourism and the tourist industry is so strong um, and, and so important uh, that regulations or, or you know, uh, shutdowns of the nightlife sector hadn't yet happened. Um, and, and yeah, that creates... Lots of problems or lots of, just, of of debates that have gone on around that. Um, and then finally, here are some of the hashtags I promised um, of, of the past few years, especially that have been part of what's been changing or at least what's what's new since I did the research for this book. So let's uh, wrap up and I'm actually going to move quickly through this and leave this for those who want to go back and maybe rewatch this video. But here, this is a moment where I rethink some of the points and observations that I had made um, in the, ch the book chapters in light of what's been happening over the last 10 years. And this also is me pivoting towards a new project that I'm developing now where I'm thinking about how, um, especially how queer rave collectives um, have uh, responded to the pandemic and also how they've engaged in grassroots activism and where did that grassroots organizing know-how uh, come from? You know, what, what what's the story of what I've seen or what I've been witnessing in the last couple of years of a real intensification in of community support um, activities in electronic dance music, um, you know, mutual aid societies, um, you know, uh, and also collectives doing community building work, doing more than putting on parties, right? Um, and so where are we in this last decade and here's where we write uh, or here's where I wrap things up right um, and this is partially also me saying you know uh, saying to myself how many times do I have to re-edit the epilogue to this book right? the book is is almost almost going into production right now into print production and I hope to not have to edit it again but every few months history happens right uh, these days and that is that that is uh, that has been a challenge for me with this book um, so here's some questions I want to leave us with. You know, I'm aware, of course, that I can't be there with you. So these are questions that I'm literally just going to throw into the air. And but hopefully these can start some conversations. So what is the new normal, if anything? Right? What is this era right now? We're not in the post-pandemic uh, era, right? And who knows when we will be, if at all. 
maybe we're post vaccine now that we're a year and a bit into every you know into not everybody having access to vaccines but most of the wealthy parts of the world um uh, and we're increasingly post lockdown although every time i say that another lockdown has to happen because we go through these cycles of masks go on masks go off numbers go up numbers go down um and in the meanwhile the you know the 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 um various strains of coronavirus become more virulent um and and uh, more dangerous right so this is part of a pattern we're going to be living in for a while, it looks like. Um, how will grassroots activism and clubbing continue into this decade? So, you know, how, how, for example, are we going to be dealing with astroturfing efforts? That is, efforts by corporations and larger, larger organizations to co-opt kind of grassroots activism in and, and community care activities in electronic music scenes. Uh, here we can think also of how um, some some organizations within dance music will happily happily platform minorities, but in a way that extracts their value for things like a brand detox or you know for their own gain, and and usually or often will leave that you know minority artist or or professional not much better off than when they you know when they were first brought in. Um, there's also the question of representation versus visibility, especially hyper visibility, right? Will the risks of violence remain so high um, or will it even get worse in the future? Um, you know, what does that mean then for collectives um, within dance music trying to organize around uh, marginalized identities? And of course, with long COVID, we're entering into a period where dance music, like the rest of the world, has to contend with a, a substantially larger percentage of their crowds living with disabilities, living, you know, um, we have to be thinking about uh, collective vulnerability, we have to be thinking about shared risk and care. Uh, and these are all things that um, are open questions. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there are discussions happening, but also there's a lot more to be done on, the, on, on this uh, front. And so with that, I will let you go and thank you so much for your time. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can uh, go to my card site, which is on the bottom here, um, theluisgarcia.card.co. I'm also a member of Room for Resistance, which is a queer intersectional collective in Berlin that does um, throw parties, but also do community care. And certainly while things have been shut down in Berlin, we've switched much more to that community care end of things. Uh, and you can find us at roomforresistance.net. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. And I hope that you have a fantastic, fantastic um, festival. <laughs>